So welcome everyone to the uh, Beginner Brewer webinar. Today we're going to discuss three easy beers to create, to brew for beginner brewers. Um, just to kick it off, a little bit about me in case you didn't know anything, if you're new to the uh, the webinar series. So I'm, I'm the creator of the beginnerbrewer.com website. I'm also a regular columnist for ONTAP magazine where I write a column every uh, edition on homebrewing. I I've been trained by the Siebel Institute as a sensory analyst, which means I can uh, judge beer and I can help brewers improve their beer. And then I also consult in the craft beer industry on process uh, recipe formulation and marketing. And I also do a lot of homebrewing, doing it since 20, uh, 2003, still making mistakes and still learning. So if you've just started, don't worry about it. There's still tons to learn, and I'm hoping that uh, the website and these webinars and everything else we do will help you uh, improve your brewing even more. So let's start with a mantra. You've got to relax when you brew beer, and you've got to remember that beer wants to be made. Never forget that. I, I, I'm on the uh, homebrew forums quite a lot, and... I see a lot of anxiety sometimes when people are really worried about their beer. I mean, it makes sense because you've invested a lot of time, effort, and money into it, and you don't want it to be ruined. But uh, you also have to remember that beer has been made for centuries, and a lot of what we know about beer suggests that it can be made accidentally. So let's not forget that. Today, we're going to be looking at beer styles, and also some of the easier styles which you can make as a home brewer. Um, I think it's important because, you know, a lot of people who start with kits will obviously start with whichever kit they've bought, and that's, that's perfectly fine, of course. Um, but if you're going to start using the methods I've discussed already in previous webinars, so if you're going to be using dried malt extract with speciality grains, for instance, or if you're already using all grain methods like brew in a bag, it makes sense to kind of have a look at styles you'd like to brew and what are some of the styles which are easier to start with versus those which are so difficult that it might discourage you if you start with them. I think that's an important point. I think if you start with some of the more difficult styles, you might get uh, disappointed. You may not want to continue with the hobby um, and that would be a pity. So today I'm going to discuss some beer styles and what they mean. I'm also going to look at some recipe formulation. Some of you in the poll we did last time suggested that we should look at that. So I'm going to be discussing recipe formulation. Um, and I'm going to discuss three styles of beer I would recommend anyone starting in the hobby to, to start with. So let's start with the three main categories of beer. A lot of people might not know about this. So the first two is very, very well known usually, ales and lagers. But the, the third one a lot of people don't know about. That's hybrids. So if you look at ales, they tend to ferment at around room temperature. So anywhere from a cellar in France room temperature, which is around 16, to more like South African room temperature, which is 25. And the yeasts are really what distinguish ales from other you know, categories of beer. Mostly that is true for all categories of beer, as yeast is such an important aspect of beer formulation and beer recipe. So ale yeast tend to produce fruitier flavors when they ferment, mostly because they ferment so well at higher temperatures. And those higher temperatures make the fermentation very vigorous. And in that vigorous fermentation, some of the chemical compounds that the yeast would produce taste to our palate at least very fruity. Banana flavors, clove-like flavors, tropical flavors even. So that's what distinguishes the ales from the other categories of beer. The second one is obviously the most well-known in the world. It's the most brewed category in the world, and that's lager. Lager yeast ferments at a much lower temperature, as you can see there, much lower range. And because of that, and because of the way lager yeasts have been bred and cultivated, they produce a much cleaner, crisper flavor. So the lager yeasts don't impart a lot of flavor to the beer. Instead, the brewer will rather use hops and malt and so on to flavor the lager. But the yeast itself, its main job is to ferment out the beer pretty dry, so it, it's very efficient at fermenting all the fermentable sugars in the beer, which means it's going to end up as a drier beer, which is why a lot of lagers are quite dry in their finish. And the temperature, of course, also ensures that less fruity flavors are produced. 
Loggy is also, by the way, known for producing quite a lot of sulfuric byproducts when it ferments. So if you are making lagers, you may smell that. It's one of the few beers where if you're fermenting it, you can probably smell that fermentation and it is a bit sulfuric. Um, you know, but it, it doesn't necessarily stay in the beer. In fact, the more you smell it, the better because it means it's actually being blown off by the fermentation. Um, but that is a common byproduct for lager fermentation. And then the final one, it's actually one of my favorite categories. The, the very first beer I brewed commercially as a, as a craft brewer was a hybrid. Um, and that's when you use either ale or lager yeast in unconventional ways. So they are not necessarily using different kinds of yeast, but you are stressing the yeasts a little bit, or you are using them unconventionally and producing interesting beers that way. Okay, so those are the three categories. So now you can entertain friends and family with your beer knowledge and bore them to tears like I do. We're talking about the three categories of, uh, of beer. Let's look into each one in a little greater detail. Within each category, there are literally hundreds of specific styles. Um, and this is just, again, for me, the wonderment of brewing beer. There are hundreds and hundreds of different styles of beer you can brew. And of course, if you're a home brewer, you have access to all of them. Depending on which method you use, you may have a little bit of a limitation. I discussed that last time when we talked about um, extract with speciality grain brewing. In some of those methods, you are not necessarily going to have access to all the styles, but most of them. Of course, if you're an all grain brewer, you will have access to literally every single style ever invented and a few more which are still being invented. So it's a wonderful thing, the diversity of beer. Um, it's kind of sad to me that there are so few commercially available diverse beers out there. It is improving, of course, um, but still to this day, mostly what you will find on the shelf in the liquor store will be lagers and a few ales, uh, but there are many, many more to choose from. So I've subcategorized these into categories which are actually used by um, the Cicerone Foundation. So in, in, it started in the States and a Cicerone is the beer equivalent of a sommelier. So uh, a sommelier obviously being a, someone who helps you pair wine um, at dinner at a restaurant and a Cicerone does that with beer. And being a Cicerone takes a lot of training um, there aren't a lot of master Cicerones out there, very much like there aren't a lot of master sommeliers out there. And uh, I would argue that a Cicerone's job is far more difficult because whilst a sommelier has to kind of know quite a few wine styles, obviously, quite a few hundred, uh, Cicerones literally have to know thousands of styles of beer. Um, and these categories, subcategories, are what they use to explain the, the flavors of beer. So I thought it might be useful to use them here. So malt forward ales, one of the, the, the sort of subcategorized styles, if you like, include things like brown ales, a lot of your Scottish ales, porters. So these are obviously available commercially. You may have had stouts or, or something similar. Those are all malt forward ales. So the predominant flavor is the malt you're using. Hop forward ales, however, are things like your American pale ales, your IPAs. I'm a very big fan of IPAs. I, I drink a lot of them. Um, so that's where you're trying to showcase hops more than the other ingredients. And then there's a whole bunch of light ales. So your wheat, some of your wheat beers are in here, your blonde ales, cream ales, and so on. Table beers is a, a Belgian style of beer, which is very low alcohol, uh, sort of often a wheat um, addition to that beer. Uh, in fact, in South Africa, you can get a really nice version of that, uh, which uh, Little Wolf makes. Little Wolf Breweries in the Cape, they make a, a table beer, which is well worth trying out if you haven't tried it. And then many ales really predominate the yeast. So it's more of the yeast, which is the, the star of the show, if you like. And that's especially the Belgian type of ales. Your golden ales, your doubles, your saisons, your sour beers as well. These are all beers which, which showcase the yeast and everything else is sort of in the background. So you can see, depending on your recipe formulation and the methods you use, you can produce any one of these types of flavor profiles and ales. Lager is a little bit less complex. So you can also have malt forward and hop forward, just like in the ales. Your malt forward lagers, dark lagers, amber lagers, and so on. There are a few available. Um, and Union is a craft brewery in South Africa, which actually brews in Germany. And uh, they make an, a pretty good dark lager as well as a pretty good amber lager. And then a lot of your lagers are really hop forward. So typical classic styles like your Pilsners and your Czech Pilsners, 
tend to really predominate in the hops they, they use. Often very European style hops. So it would be hops like Hallertauer and um, Sars. And those, those have a spicy kind of characteristic, um, even honeyed flavor. Um, so not very tropical flavor like the American hops you find in the Hop Forward Ales, but a more spicy, sort of herbaceous uh, quality for the Hop Forward lagers. And then you've got a whole bunch of light lagers. Light lagers are the single most produced type of lager out there. And that would be things like your light American lagers, like your, your Bud Light and Coors Light and so on. Uh, but there are a few others. Your, your Hellers, which is a, a German style, a very light lager. It's, uh, it's sort of the German version, I guess, of a table beer. And if, uh, there are quite a few pale European lagers um, in this category. So they they mean to kind of be very well balanced between hops and uh, malt and a very uh, kind of attenuated taste, quite crisp, quite uh, refreshing, uh, you know, quick off the palate, uh, quite high carbonation and not a whole bunch of flavor. So generally you won't find a lot of craft brewers going for the light lager style. You'll find them criticizing light lager style quite a bit. And I'm, I'm certainly guilty of that myself. But ultimately it's actually a very difficult style to brew properly because you don't have a lot of things to hide behind. Um, there's very little malt, there's very little hops, the yeast is very clean. And so if you make a mistake brewing a light lager, everyone's gonna know about it. So it is technically a difficult beer sometimes to make, but um, for a beer drinker, it's, it's sort of, you know, not, not the most exciting of things to drink. And then hybrids, there's three kind of main types where you would also have a malt forward hybrid, an alt beer, is a German style uh, hailing from Dusseldorf. And that is when you, uh, an ale is made with, with very low temperature um, fermentation. So it's almost using an ale yeast like a lager yeast. So if you ferment a ale yeast at very, very low temperatures, almost, almost low enough not to have it be very effective, you might produce something like an alt beer. And it, it mostly predominates the malt flavors and it has interesting flavors because of the different way an ale yeast will ferment at lower temperatures. It won't produce as many fruity flavors, although there definitely will still be some. Um, and because the, the ale yeast is not very effective at that temperature, there's a lot of residual sugar which still remains in the beer. And so alt beers can be a little bit um, sweet to the taste. Then hop forward hybrids, this is the one I spoke of earlier, my, one of my favorite categories of uh, of beer and one of my favorite styles is the California Common, also known as a steam beer. And California Commons is what happens when you ferment lager yeast at ale temperature. So if you take a, a typical German lager strain and you ferment it at room temperature, so around 18 to 20 degrees Celsius, it produces some very interesting flavors. So it's, it's a little bit of a difficult beer to create um, accurately because lager yeast, like I said before, produce quite a lot of sulfuric compounds. So the main um, challenge in making a good California common is not to have too much sulfur compounds remain in your beer. There are tricks to doing that. Uh, but ultimately what you end up with is a very interesting beer. It's got fruity flavors, but it finishes nice and crisp because of the lager yeast. And it's, it's a very flavorsome, interesting beer. I'm, I'm a big fan of the California commons. And then you also get light hybrids. So Kolsch is probably the most famous example. And again, a, a German style. In Germany, you, you will see them served in very tiny little glasses. Uh, they're very refreshing. There are ales, which are fermented at lager temperatures, again, um, similar to the alt beer, but because they don't have a very complex malt bill, they're very light and crisp and uh, very, very refreshing. Slight flavor, uh, fruit flavors as well because of the um, ale yeast, but uh, not as much as a normal ale. And cultures are very, like I said, very refreshing. Um, there are a few commercial examples in South Africa. I know that um, Draymond's Brewery produces a pretty good version of one. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you know that brewery, go and try it out. It's a very interesting beer, very, very refreshing. And usually also light in alcohol. Okay, we've covered, this is the, this must have been the quickest crash course in all the styles of beer I've ever done. There's obviously tons of stuff to talk about and, and maybe in future webinars we, we should you know, go into particular styles a little bit deeper. But today we're going to look at three styles in much greater detail. But before we do, I have to ask the question of what makes a beer easy to brew? How do you decide? 
Well, for one, it has to be forgiving. If you're beginning in brewing, you don't need something which is very complicated, which, you know, sort of is on a knife edge. And there are some beers like that, you know, like you make one little mistake and everyone's going to know about it. You don't want those sort of beers. So you want simple brewing schedules, simple fermentation schedules, nothing too complicated. You also don't want too much need for temperature control. That's one of the things most home brewers struggle with is temperature control, especially during fermentation. Um, you know, one of the things which is really distinguishes, you know, commercial brewers from home brewers is their ability to control the fermentation temperature very exactly using things like jacketed fermenters. You don't have that as a home brewer. You at most might have a fridge you've converted, which is great. That's pretty good. But if you're starting out, you probably don't have that either. So we want to focus on beers where it's got a, a broad range of temperatures it can ferment at without necessarily ruining the taste of the beer. And by the way, that's kind of why lagers for me are out as a category for the first couple of beers you're gonna make because they really do require quite a lot of temperature control to make properly. I mean, I know there are kit, a lot of lager kits out there and it's obviously a good commercial choice, I guess, because a lot of people know lagers. So if you wanna sell your kit, make it a lager kit, but I'm, I've, I've very seldom tasted a homebrewed lager from a beginning brewer, especially one made out of a kit, which tastes at all like a lager or even any good. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's because the temperature control is often very off and the lager yeast will, you know, rampantly create uh, sulfur compounds and go all funny um, and won't ferment your beer in a crisp way. So you often end up with a very fruity, tasting lager, but with not, not a good kind of fruitiness and even a lot of sulfuric off taste. So sometimes when you open some of these, uh, you know, kit lagers, they do smell a little bit like uh, putting your head inside of a matchbox uh, because of all that sulfur. And that's by the way, one of the sort of things you have to do, look out for when you try and detect all flavors in your beer is uh, smells of hell, sulfur, not good, not good for your beer. Never a good, never a good uh, flavor in beer. And then also it's less likely to show common errors, right? So the darker malts, beers with more malt complexity, with more hops added, tend to be more forgiving because even if you do make some mistakes, those things will hide the mistakes. Um, you know, one of the, you know, the easiest way to hide a mistake in beer is to add more malt or add more hops. And the, the overpowering flavor of those things will often, you know, really mask some of the mistakes you may have made. And that's, that's something to keep in mind. So the lighter the malt pool, the lighter the hop addition, the more easy it will be to detect the mistake. And that's why I said earlier, a light lager, even though it's not terribly exciting to drink, is technically very difficult to create because any mistake you make will be amplified by the, the lack of any of these things in the beer. Simple ingredients makes it be easier to brew. So even though you know, I'm, I'm just a moment ago I said complexity of malts. What I meant is more darker malts or more kiln or stewed malts, but not as many different kinds of malts. Um, for instance, if you're going to make an Imperial Russian stout, that's the most complex malt bill of any beer. It's got just about any malt you can imagine thrown in there. And even though it will hide a lot of your mistakes, it also is difficult to work with all these different malts and kind of keep them all in your head and know how to use them. So fewer malts will be better, fewer different kinds of hops is what I should have said there, fewer varieties of hops and simple yeast using dried yeast, either a, a sort of a classic English ale or a, um, American ale yeast is the way to go for your first couple of brews. They won't ever fail you. They're incredibly well-designed yeasts. They're well-bred. They work under wide temperature ranges. They produce very few off flavors. Um, they're very resilient to poor storage and to other, you know, practices you, you know, they may have encountered. And so those are all very good things to use. And it should be accessible. So there are easy beers to make, but they often fail at this level for me because there aren't any commercial examples for you to compare them to. So sure, you, you, it's probably not all that difficult to make. Um, now I can't think of a, an obscure beer, but uh, there are a couple out there but you, you will be hard pressed to find good commercial examples. I mean, a brown ale is actually a good example. Uh, in South Africa, we don't see a lot of those. In England, it's a very popular style. Um, so if you have a friend in England who can send you Newcastle brown ale, that, that's a typical example of a brown ale. 
But because there are very few examples, if any, in South Africa, it's difficult because you can't compare it against, you know, your own beer. So you can't really judge the success of your brewing in terms of how close to that style did I get. I mean, having said that, you know, I, I don't want to make it sound as though, you know, there's not a black van trolling South African suburbs, which will, you know, you know, kidnap you while you're not looking and drag you uh, into a little room to interrogate you if you, if you not didn't brew to style. Okay. It's not a, it's not a police, uh, not a police thing, but it's a good practice to try and get to a particular style and to try and master particular styles of beer uh, because it, it teaches you a lot of different things about brewing and about how to work with beer ingredients properly to the point where when you master these styles, you can then start breaking the rules. You can start combining them. You can start altering the way they work. And, and then you can really start producing your own signature beers. But before you get there, you kind of have to know what these styles do and how they operate. Otherwise, you, you know, you, you're sort of just blindly going along and, and putting things together almost at random. And that's not really going to often result in a very, very good beer. Okay. So these are the three beers I would suggest any beginner brewer starts with. So these three, no, no particular order, they're not necessarily in particular order of uh, difficulty, but these would be all kinds of beers which I would really recommend you give a shot when you start with. Uh, my favorite is the English Best Bitter to start with, that's kind of why I put it first, but it's not necessarily easier than the other two. And then American Amber Ales, really nice beers to start with, and Porters. So they, they, to my mind, meet all of the criteria which I've already mentioned in terms of what makes a beer easier to brew. So let's start with each one and I'm going to take you through how to construct recipes, how they work, what's in them and so on. Okay, so the English best bitters. Let's, let's go through the style and I'm going to try and guide you through what, what makes a good English bitter. So your objective as the brewer in, in this sort of... Um, style of beer is it's you're trying to get to a very well balanced beer with a very solid multi backbone and relatively moderate bitterness so even though they're called bitters in comparison to beers like your american pale ales and ipas they're not that bitter they they're relatively bitter but not that bitter it's called a bitter just because at the time of its invention around about the turn of the century um in comparison to beers back then which were quite sweet bitters were extremely bitter and that that's how they got their name the, the malt flavors you're going to get out of a bitter will be sort of toffee, bread, caramel, nice flavors. Really, it's, it's a nice sort of uh, malt backbone in this beer, which you're trying to achieve. And the malt you'll be using will make sure that you get that, that flavor in the beer. And then the hops is usually of, of a British variety. And the British hops like Fuggles and East Ken Goldings will impart a kind of a herb-like or a woody flavor um, you know, to the beer, even like a bit of a dry finish, although the finish itself more comes from the, the dryness of the beer itself in terms of its fermentation. And then the yeast, often very fruity. So you can see how all these three things combine into a very, very tasty beer. You know, you've got your caramel flavors, you've got your herb-like flavors and your fruity flavors. I mean, it, it's just a wonderful beer. And then a, a touch of butterscotch is acceptable. So that is one of the byproducts of yeast. Ale yeast especially produces... Um, this compound called diacetyl. Diacetyl is a normal byproduct of fermentation. In large quantities, it's always a flaw in beer. It shouldn't taste like you're eating a, a stick of butter. Um, if you do have that in your beer, that is a flaw. It means that something went wrong in the fermentation. But a little bit of that in a, in a British uh, base beer can be okay. So just to, to note that. And usually very low to moderate carbonation. So you're not going to have a very fizzy beer here. So when you are going to bottle condition the best bitter, you're going to use less, a little bit less of the um, bottling sugar, which you're going to use to kind of condition the beer. You don't want it to be too fizzy. Um, it, it shouldn't be uncarbonated either. That's a mistake. I know that there's this weird idea that a lot of English ales are like completely uncarbonated. That's not true. All beers have carbonation. It's just some of them are very light carbonation. And it's also not a very strong beer in terms of alcohol content. Three to five percent is usually the standard. Some commercial examples you can try. You can get one in most liquor stores nowadays, depending on where you live. Uh, you can get the Fuller's range of beers. 
uh, there's a couple of others as well, which uh, come from Britain, which have the, the base bitter uh, style. Locally, um, not that common. I know Brixt, uh, New Brixton Breweries in Johannesburg, they produce one called Brixton Bitter. And I'm down in the Cape, I know that Megan um, Gemel from Clockwork Brewery makes a really good bitter as well. So if you can get your hands on any of those, very good commercial examples to compare your beer against. So what are the basic ingredients and how do we kind of construct these things together? So depending on which method you're going to use, if you're a, an extract plus speciality grain brewer, you'll obviously use your dried malt extract. And dried malt extract, the way it is constructed in this country and the way it's um, produced, actually has a lot of the flavors you need already in it. So it's got some biscuity flavors. It's got some toffee-like flavors. So it's a pretty good base for a best bitter. That's why I, I often recommend people brew the style when they start with uh, dried malt extract because it already almost is a pre-packaged malt bowl for a best bitter. If you're an all-grain brewer, your base malt will be a pale malt. So any kind of pale malt, pale ale malt. I wouldn't use Pilsner malt in this, in this example because Pilsner malt has a little bit too much um, sort of maltiness, too much graininess um, for, for what you need in a, in a bitter and it might come out and, and it won't be quite what you're looking for. So any kind of pale malt will be useful for, for the base malt. And then the specialty malts you'll be using if you or an extract uh, brewer, you'll be using crystal malts, a light crystal malt. So in other words, uh, it's, it's a crystal malt which hasn't been stewed for very long. And so it has a light color and a light sort of sugary flavor. Um, and so you can usually, most homebrew stores will be able to tell you what are the light and darker crystal malts. Some will, will rate it according to Loverbond, which is an international unit of measurement for color. And look out for that. It will be an owl that is the symbol for Loverbond. And it will often have something like 20L or 80L or 120L, um, you know, after the, the name of the crystal malt. So look out for that. And in, in case of a base bitter, you want a lighter. So you want to go from somewhere 20 to 60 Loverbond um, crystal malt is what you want. You don't want to go much darker than that because then the color of the beer is going to be very, very dark. And then it's also going to be too sugary in its flavor. If you use all grain methods, you will be using crystal malt as well, but you'll be adding some Munich malt. And the Munich malt is a special kind of malt. It's a base malt. Um, it can, uh, it has enzymatic action, but what's different from uh, a pale malt is Munich malts are kilned a little bit more than the pale malts are. And that creates a more biscuity, uh, bready flavor in them. And so when you combine them with pale malt, it gives you a very nice toffee biscuit kind of uh, flavor in your beer. But as I said before, as I'm, I've done a lot of experimentation with dried malt extract. And in my estimation, it's very similar to having a pale malt plus Munich malt malt bull. If you use dried malt extract, very, very close to, to that. And then other fermentables. This is one of the few ones in, in my list where you're going to be using other fermentables. You'll be using Lyle's Golden Syrup. That lovely stuff comes in the green can. Um, you know, it's it, they aren't. I used to I used to think that you could substitute this with any old syrup. So you know, Woolworths has one, and you get you know sort of no name brand ones and so on. I know Elova makes one. I really would actually not recommend that. The difference between these are quite large. Um, main difference is Lyle's Golden Syrup really has very little else in it but sugar and you know acid. Or, or lemon juice. Um, so it's an invert sugar. So you're adding the, the lemon juice or the citric acid so that the uh, sugar doesn't crystallize and go solid. Um, and it has very high quality sugar, which it's made out of. Probably comes from South Africa, the sugar. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, whereas the other golden syrups, if you look at the ingredient list, they often have salt in it. And that's a bad idea because salt and beer are not great partners. Um, and if it's too much salt in it can really start affecting the taste of the beer. Also, some of the, the sugars are very dark and they, they really, you know, sort of blast the, the sugar when they make those um, syrups. And it has almost a licorice type of flavor, which you would associate more with things like molasses, which again is an interesting flavor in beer, but not in a best bitter. So really, you kind of have to use Lyle's Golden Syrup. That's, there's no real substitute for that. Uh, you can make your own invert sugar. That is definitely possible. 
and you can really just use table sugar and you would you would melt it with some water into a sort of a thick you know pouring syrup and you would add uh, either lemon juice or uh, citric acid if you have that but most people can just use lemon juice um, to invert the sugar and uh, that you can make your own so that's that is an, a possibility if you really really can't find Lyle's golden syrup I would just make my own if I was you at least then you know what's in it but do not add salt or molasses or anything like that to the, that particular syrup by the way um, I just want to take a, a moment to breathe it's always useful to breathe when you're doing a webinar um, don't forget to uh, post any questions you may have um, on the chat uh, channel so you can access it in your controls which you should see I hope um, and if you go to the chat you can drop any kind of question there for me it can be related to what we're talking about it can be completely unrelated to anything homebrewing uh, so please do drop some questions as we go I'm, I'm always trying to address all the questions at the end of the webinar and it is a kind of a great opportunity for me to interact with you and, and see what's on your mind so don't uh, don't be shy and just drop some questions on the chat channel. Okay, let's move on. So hops, as I've mentioned, you're mostly going to be using the British hops. You can't really replace these hops with anything else, unfortunately, um, because they have such unique flavors. Uh, fortunately, in South Africa, they're pretty easy to get your hands on. Most homebrew shops usually will have Fuggles and East Kent Goldings in stock. Um, and both of these hops have very herbaceous almost forest floory kind of flavors, um, even spicy notes in the, in, the, in the case of East Kent Goldings. And they, very, they really are quite unique. Um, and that is a large part of what makes a best bitter. A best bitter is this hop bill. Um, and, and you will just taste the difference if, with these hops in, in the bitter. And then the yeast will be uh, kind of SO4 is usually the one which is available in South Africa, but any English ale yeast will be fine. Um, and what's nice about the English ale yeast you find, especially the dried ones, they have a very wide temperature range they work on. So especially your SO4 is known to be pretty stable at lower temperatures or higher temperatures. Um, and so that's a very, very forgiving yeast to use in almost any beer, but certainly in the best bitter. So that's how you're going to construct your, your basic recipe for a best bitter. If you've got all these malts, specialty malts, fermentables and hops and yeast in it, You've, you've got all the ingredients of a really, really good best bitter. Okay, so that's a pretty easy style to make. Um, later on, if you want to make it more complex, you can do things like adding wood to the beer. So a lot of the best bitters in England are actually aged in wood barrels, in, in oak barrels, um, to add a bit more woody flavor, more spicy flavors, even vanilla flavors come out. And you can simulate that as a, as a beginner brewer pretty easily by taking some wood, chips so those kind of chips you use for smoking meat uh, oak is is the preferred one here obviously because that's the the wood they use for best bitters and and just taking like a handful like about 300 grams or so should do it for a 19 liter batch take a lot of oak chips um, I, just to sterilize it i would steam them so you can chuck them in a colander for instance over a pot of boiling water um, and just steam them put some foil over the colander to keep the steam in there. And if you steam them for about 15 minutes or so, you can pretty much consider that sterile. And then you can chuck them in the fermenter. So I would normally do that after primary fermentation. So on day three or four of your fermentation, you can, you can chuck those wood chips in and then you can just leave them. You don't have to do anything with them. You don't have to stir the beer or anything. They'll settle in the beer and, and mingle. And it does actually work. It gives your your beer flavor similar to something which has been aged in an oak barrel. And that, that's probably what you can do to really create a super authentic best bitter, but you don't have to do it right away. You can leave that for later. If you're starting out with beer, my recommendation is don't mess with a fermenter. Just leave it. Let the yeast do, you know, let the yeast do what it's supposed to do. Don't open your fermenter unless you're measuring the beer. And even then you shouldn't be doing it too often. Okay, next up is the American Amber Ale. Let's have a look at this one. This is one of my favorites. I always have an American Amber Ale in my fridge. It just, it's a fantastic style of beer as far as I'm concerned. Um, what is it all about? So yeah, it's, it's not completely dissimilar from the, the bitter, but an American Amber is far more caramel forward. It's really a way to showcase caramel or crystal malt. 
um, is one of the objectives you have as a brewer of an American amber. And like so many of the American beers, it has a very uh, strong hoppiness to it. So you're trying to complement that complexity of caramel flavor with a lot of your more um, kind of citrusy and tropical flavors from the American hops. So combined, they are just fantastic beers to drink very food friendly um you know you can have them with almost any food you can cook with it so you know stick it in a sauce and you'll 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 see the difference um a lovely beer malts similar to the bitter we just discussed uh but more caramel for it so you're also going to have the toffee and biscuit flavors but definitely caramel is the star of the show here you have to taste it if you if you drink an amber ale your hops is very different so we're going to be using the american hops which mostly come with citrus pine resin Uh, forest floor kind of flavors and uh, tropical flavors so it's a very i mean i love the american hops i use a lot of it in my own brewing uh, because of that sort of very bright citrusy lemon kind of flavors pineapple flavors it it brings to the table and your yeast is going to be cleaner so you don't want to impart too much fruity flavor here from the yeast because your hops already has a lot of fruit in it so your yeast is going to be cleaner more crisp um, and the American ale yeast tend to produce more clean fermentations than the British ale yeast. And that's why we're going to be using those. A bit more carbonated, so moderate carbonation is what you're aiming for in an amber ale. You don't want it to be too, too low in carbonation. The reason for that, the caramel flavors will start building up on your tongue. and It will start becoming overly sweet. So carbonation is a wonderful aid in beer. What it really does, if you think about it, is it cleans your tongue, Right. That's why beer, by the way, is, is better food, is better pairing with cheese than wine. I, I still don't quite understand why wine and cheese is a thing. You know, everyone, all of us have probably gone to a wine and cheese evening or something in our life, or have to, people told us that, you know, wine and cheese go together. They don't really go together. If you speak to sommelier, they'll have to admit begrudgingly that uh, cheese and wine are not their favorite thing to try and pair. And that's why often um, they will pair it with a dessert wine something like a port or a sherry, because at least the sweetness of those wines mask the fattiness of the cheese on your tongue. And that's about as much you can do. Beer, because of the carbonation, actually cleans that fattiness off your tongue and is a fantastic pairing to cheese. Um, so if you ever really want to do yourself a favor, have a lot of cheese and beer pairings, and you'll, you'll see the difference. Okay. Uh, moderate ABV, so they can go up to six or even a little bit more. Um, so your American amber ales can be a little stronger, um, but they won't ever go really above six um, or six and a half. It's probably as much as you'd like in an amber ale. Quite a few commercial examples in South Africa. So um, I'm not the only guy who, who likes them. A lot of our, our craft brewers also really, really fond of, of the amber ales, especially the American style of amber ale. And here are three really good examples. Um, Currently, my favorite is probably this car park, John, by um, Richmond Hill Brewing. Uh, they in Port Elizabeth, I think. And really fantastic example. It's almost like a, a, a absolutely paradigm example of a American amber ale. So if you, if you read the style description in something like the BJC, BJCP guide, um, it'll pretty much nail every single one of those descriptions if you, if you have a car park, John. Lumberjack, also a lovely beer by Jack Black. It's been around for a long time. Um, a little hoppier than the Carpar John, and also a very nice example of an American Amber. And then Alliance by Citizen Beer. I don't know if they're still around, actually. I haven't heard much about them recently, but they, they were one of the first breweries to produce a American Amber. So it's a contract brew. I think they were brewed by um, Boston Breweries down in the Cape. Uh, but yeah, very good examples. And there's probably quite a few more, which I'm forgetting about right now, but those three are easily um, attainable, mostly if you have a reasonable liquor store or a reasonable pub, which um, sells some good craft beer. And the other style is an Irish red ale, which is also an amber ale, but it's a, it's an Irish style. It's not the same as this. Um, so just make sure you, you, you buy the right one if you want to compare your American amber ale. Okay, what, what goes into this? beer. Again, obviously with extract brewing, you are going to be using your dried malt extract as the base. Again, with, a, with an all grain approach, you will be using pale malt. Okay, That's pretty much standard for all ales uh, in most styles. You'll be using pale malts. But the speciality malts are different in terms of um, comparing it to something like a bitter. 
in your American Amber Ale, you'll be using different, at least two different kinds of crystal malts. That's sort of why I said earlier, it's a, it's a showcase of crystal malts. And usually it's going to be a, a lighter and a darker crystal malt. So you're going to layer the crystal malts a little bit more than you do in a bitter, where it's really just there to pr provide a little bit of um, caramel flavor. In the American Amber, you're going to push the percentage of crystal malt up to 10, 12, even 15% of the entire grain bowl. Um, so, and that's true for whether you use DME or, or pale malt. And so that's, a, that's one way of, of starting to think about recipe formulation is it's very useful to know the percentage of different malts you have as a, as a percentage of your entire grain malt, I mean grain bowl, uh, because that's a useful way of talking about it. And you'll often find when people write about recipes and styles of beer, they'll say things like, don't go over 10% crystal malt for this style. That's what they mean. Uh, but with the American Amber Ale, you can push it a little bit up to 15%, although more than that is not recommended because then the crystal caramel flavors become way too intense. Um, and also in the, mix, in the mixture of dark and light crystal malts, you want to favor light crystal and um, so it's sort of a third, two thirds approach of, of admixture. So you're gonna have about a third of dark crystal malts. Now dark crystal malts will be anything sort of over 80 Lovey Bond. Uh, the most common one you can find here in South Africa is about 120. Um, and and that, that's sort of uh, what you wanna, what to aim for for the dark. And in a uh, name, I'm trying to think of it. Uh, Vayaman is a, is a maltster which is commonly used here in South Africa. A lot of homebrew shops um, stock Vayaman malts. And if it's not on their website, you can just ask them who the maltsters are. And they have one called Coramunic 2 is the trade name for that crystal malt. And that's quite a dark 120 lower bond crystal malt you can use. And then what you will also use um, is just a touch of chocolate malt or roasted malt. Just a touch. So literally... Um, it'll, it'll come in at sort of not even a percent, sometimes one, one percent at most. Um, and the reason you put the chocolate malts or any roasted malt like roasted barley or something like that in it is for color. Um, you're not going to really taste those malts very much in the beer, but when you combine crystal malt and your darker roasted malts together, they have a tendency to produce a very intense red color in a beer. And obviously this is an amber ale. It's a red ale. So you really want to push that, that nice, dark, rich, red color in the beer. It's all part of appreciating beer. You know, beer is not just the flavor or the aroma. It's the whole package. It's the, the, the color of the beer, what it looks like in the glass. It's, this, it's the aroma. It's the body of it, the mouthfeel, the aftertaste. It's, it's all those different things which combine into making beer what it is. And that's what you, why you would put a little bit of roasted malt or chocolate malt into your malt bowl. And then if you're an all grain brewer, you can get a lot of red color and flavor, sort of, a, again, a biscuity flavor out of a malt called melanoidin malt. Uh, again, it's melanoidin malt is the name of that kind of malt. And some maltsters use that name. Sometimes they don't. So Vayamin uh, calls their melanoidin malt something different. Um, you know, so there's a couple of trade names. And if you, if you just do a search online for melanoidin malt names, you'll find uh, quite a few sites which will list that. I should probably list that on Beginner Brewer as well um, to, to, to kind of get the trade name because sometimes in a homebrew stores, they will give you the trade name of the malt, but they won't necessarily tell you what kind of malt it is. So just to keep that in mind. Of course, you can just call the homebrew store owner and if they know what they're doing, they'll know what melanoidin malts uh, they stock. We won't be using any other fermentables in this beer. Uh, you don't really need to dry it out so that one of the things which the Lyle's Golden Syrup does in the, in the bitter, the English bitter, is it dries out the beer quite a bit. And so you want that nice dry finish, um, which accentuates a lot of the herbaceous flavors of the bitter. In an amber ale, you want the, the beer to finish in a medium sort of sweetness. So it's not super dry. Um, there is some residual sugar, not so much as to build up in your tongue and start becoming cloying, but you want a kind of a medium body to the amber ale and that's why you won't necessarily add any sugar or anything like that which is going to make it drier and lighter in body okay uh, please keep those questions coming thanks but thanks by the way for them i really appreciate them. hops all the sea you'll hear people talk about sea hops 
uh, the, the about two years ago there was a massive problem in the supply of sea uh, hops in the world uh, there was there were some uh, bugs which ate a lot of the hop crops in america and they kind of ran out um, of all these sea hops cascade centennial chinook citra um, and all of these hops have tropical piney resiny kind of flavors lemon flavors cascade is a, is a hop which has a very grapefruit flavor so it's predominant smell. If you stick your nose in a bag of Cascade, it, it smells a lot like grapefruit. I'm weird. I stick my nose in bags of hops all day long. It's kind of strange. But uh, my family's learned how to live with me. So Centennial, uh, also a lovely hop, lovely uh, forest, piney flavors coming out of it. Chinook as well, very resiny. Um, Magnum is a bit cleaner, but very, very bitter. And Citra very, very commonly used in South Africa. Citra is probably one of the most popular hops right now in the world. Um, and it's got a very lemongrass, lemon type of flavor. So all of these kinds of hops will be great in an American amber. Um, and yeast, again, you want a crisp, clean fermentation. So not as clean as a lager fermentation, but as clean as an ale gets, which would, would, will often be your American ale yeast. So the USO5, uh, for dry yeast, often is the kind of yeast you're going to be using, or any kind of dry yeast which says American ale yeast, that's what you want to go for. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to create a nice crisp, very light fruitiness to the beer, um, but mostly just a clean fermentation. A nice characteristic of the American ale yeast, by the way, is they have very, very high um, flocculent sort of uh, yeast. So they, what, what that means is they, they drift to the bottom of the fermenter very quickly, um, which has some advantages for if you want to reuse this yeast later. That's another topic, though. I think we should have a webinar, though, on reusing yeast. I, I really don't think um, you should be buying a packet of yeast every time you brew. It's a tremendous waste of money. Um, and you're losing out on the amazingly improved flavor of multiple generation yeast. So most commercial brewers do cultivate their own yeast. And they use multiple generations of yeast. They, they clean the yeast from a particular fermentation and they reuse that yeast. It's not difficult to do. It's actually kind of easy. Um, and it's a wonderful thing to be able to cultivate your own yeast and reuse your yeast and not have to worry about, oh, you know, the homebrew stores have run out of dry yeast. Now what am I going to do? If you've got some in the fridge, chances are you're going to make a really excellent beer. So just a, a, a note to myself, I guess, that we should talk about reusing yeast in a, in a future webinar. So yeah, please keep the, the questions coming. I will address them at the end. Final style we're going to look at is a porter. The porter is an interesting one. Um, it came from England around about the turn of the century as well. It's named after the porters of the train stations of, of London. Um, and, you know, those big ones like Paddington Square and those places. And what, what happened was the porters, obviously very physical work back in the day when people, you know, traveled with heavy luggage. Um, and at the end of the day, the porters used to come together and they had a beer. Now, the pubs in, the, in these stations, what they used to do is they used to take all the leftover ales for that day, in the, which was left in the casks, and they would mix them together, and that would be the a cheap beer for the porters to have. And it's, it was a really good beer. And a lot of people started drinking this and thought, well, that's not too bad. And so the style of the porter was born. Um, it's a dark beer. Um, and, and it's no longer made by mixing ales together anymore. It used to be, but no, there are almost no breweries I know of who, who will still do that. So now it's just a style of beer which you do from scratch. So what are you trying to achieve? It's a very dark ale, so it's often either opaque or a very dark cola kind of color. Um, if you want some chocolate and roasted flavors, so that's some of the predominant flavor. This is a the malt forward ale. So the malts are going to give you the most of the flavor here, but it's well balanced. I think this is the, the key to a really good porter. Is it, there's no one ingredient, not, nor the malt, nor the uh, yeast, nor the, the hops, which predominate. So you're going to want them all in nice balance. Okay. And the malts you're going to be using will impart again, some caramel flavor, but less so. So less caramel flavor than you would find in a bitter or an amber ale and more chocolate and coffee flavors. It's actually kind of amazing. I, I still kind of, I mean, I've been brewing since 2003, and I still am blown away 
by the fact that you can put malt in, into something and taste it. It tastes like you actually put coffee into that thing. Or if you can put, you know, or it tastes like you actually put some real chocolate into that thing. That to me is an incredible thing. Um, the, the diversity of flavors you can get out of malts and hops for that matter is just incredible. So it makes our hobby such a fantastic one, I think. Hops, not a lot of hops here. Um, you know, the, the, the malts are so strong and so roasted that it will often overpower your more delicate, noble hops, which you find in England. Um, and if anything, you're going to have some herbaceous flavors, but not too much. It's more of a clean bitterness. So the hops really in this particular um, beer is there to balance out the sweetness of the malt and not much else. You don't want to have a hoppy porter. That, that's a different style of beer. It's not a porter. Um, your yeast will also be quite clean, um, but a little bit of fruitiness is fine. And also very similar to the bitter, low to moderate carbonation. It can be a little bit more carbonated. Some people are kind of sensitive to the bitterness of malt. Um, so there's, hops has one kind of bitterness. Malt imparts a different kind of bitterness to, to beer. And in a porter, because you're using a lot of roasted malts, they are very bitter. If you, if you taste the bitter malt, if you eat that malt, you'll find that it has a bitter aftertaste. If you, if you then put too much hops in, you'll overbitter your beer. That's why in a porter, your hop bill is not very large. You're not going to put a whole bunch of hops in a porter because the malts themselves actually lend a lot of bitterness to the beer. But some people are very sensitive to that, that particular kind of malt bitterness. I'm like that. I know quite a few people who it just hits you in the back of the throat. If you're such a person and you don't like that sort of burnt flavor, what you would do is you would carbonate your porter a little bit more. And again, that'll wash away that sort of bitterness. So again, Hopefully, as we go along in this webinar series, you're, you're starting to learn that making really good beer is a matter of manipulating the different ingredients of beer to produce some sort of balance, or at least to try and achieve a particular objective. And you can manipulate every single one of these ingredients to produce some other objective which you may have in mind. And this is one of those examples. So carbonation is a is often ignored. You know, people just sort of carbonate, put the you know put a carbonation drop in and forget about it. That's why I'm not a big supporter of using carbonation drops because they just one measure. Um, where if you're using a bottle, bottling bucket and you're adding the sugar yourself at a very specific quantity, you can manipulate the level of carbonation of your beer. And I think that's something you, you should all really experiment with as home brewers. That different styles call for different carbonation. Again, moderate ABV, uh, uh, about as uh, strong as it'll get is six. But a lot of porters are actually quite low in alcohol. So the traditional ones were probably lower than four. They were probably more around three to 3.5 um, ABV. And you still get a few commercial examples which are very low in alcohol. Because again, it was meant to be refreshing after a long day. The porters had to go to work the next day. They can't exactly be completely hammered. Um, so, you know, a lot of these beers were, were quite low in alcohol for that reason. A couple of commercial examples in South Africa, quite a, a number of them in England, and there are a few you can find in our local liquor stores, who, which are brewed in England. I didn't put them here, but Fuller's also has a, a porter, which you can go find. Um, South Africa doesn't have that many porter examples. So Drifter makes a, a nice one. It's a smoked porter because um, they, they add a bit of smoked malt, but it's not that smoked. I actually think it, it tastes pretty much like a standard porter to me. And Darling Brew has one called Black Mist, which is a nice example of a good solid porter. Um, so, and you can even see there in the bottle, that's a dark beer, right? Those are dark beers. But they're very, in some ways, even though I think psychologically, we kind of want to have a dark beer when it's cold. Um, if you look at the ABV and everything else, it's not really going to be a winter warmer necessarily. Um, so I actually like having them in summer as well. I think they're kind of refreshing sometimes. Again, if you think about the application, it originally was for people who had a, a physical labor of being a porter. It is a relatively uh, refreshing beer. Right. Some of you are bragging about how close you stay to Drifter. That's no way to make friends. Um, I stay very far away from Drifter because I'm in Joburg. So, uh, but yeah, nice if you do. Uh, very nice brewery. Um, you know, the, the brewers there, I've, I've spoken to them a few times now, and I mean, they're great guys. So, yeah, drift, I have to support Drifter Breweries. They, they make some excellent beer. Okay, back to Porter. What do we want to do um, to create one? So your base malt here, 
Again, if you're an extract speciality grain brewer, you'll use DME. If you're an all-grain beer, you'll use pale malt. You'll see a theme running through these beers, right? Like I said, they're simple. You don't need to use a lot of different malts. You, for all-grain um, brewing, you want to put a bit more Munich malt in. So you can go up to 20% of your grain bill um, you know, in Munich malt. And the reason for that is it'll add a lot of color. You wanna, you're building that dark color in a way in the beer. But because Munich malt has a stronger malt flavor, a stronger biscuit toast-like flavor, it will hold up in, in the malt bowl when you add the darker malts. Whereas the pale malt is really there for producing the majority of the sugar, which you will need to ferment the beer out, the Munich malt actually will provide a, quite a lot of flavor. Um, and it is that sort of biscuity, toast-like flavor you want in a porter. That's going to be the main backbone in the malt taste. And your speciality malts are there to add a little bit of sugar. So you're going to be using your, using your darker crystal malts, but not in massive quantities, well below 10%. Um, for, for porter, you, you're aiming at around 4 to 5% of your malt bowl will be crystal malts. Your chocolate malt will also you know, be there to add flavor and color because it's very dark. And again, you want to stay sort of in the region of 5 to 6%. Um, you know, your darker malts, you're never going to go above sort of something like 10% because that's going to be overpowering. If you use too much chocolate malt, or if you use too much black malt, um, it's just going to overpower the beer. It's going to taste like you're drinking a bag of charcoal. Okay, it's not pleasant. Even if you really dig charred flavors, um, and I quite like smoked flavors, there's something like too much of that. And it will just over, it will be almost undrinkable. And also, I wouldn't, for instance, here, advocate the use of roasted barley. Uh, roasted barley is a dark roasted malt. You'll find a lot of homebrew shops do sell it. And it can be used in different styles of beer. There's something called a robust porter style, where you would maybe use some of that. But um, roasted barley is a very strong, overpowering flavor. And it's actually used in stouts. Uh, I see there was a question about the difference between a stout and a porter, and I'll get to that. But um, roasted barley is used in something like Guinness, but in very small quantities because it is such a strong flavor. Um, and even a little bit of roasted malt will give you a very dark beer with, with if you're not careful, it will, it will really be kind of a burnt flavor. So do not, I wouldn't put roasted barley in a porter if I were you. Uh, black malt, also very little. You're gonna put a touch of that in one to 2% at most because it's very, very roasted can be very bitter, uh, but it is black. So it creates a really nice dark color in your beer, which you want. Um, there is a, a black malt called debittered black malt. And some of the maltsters do produce that. It's sometimes also known as dehusked black malt. So look out for those descriptions. Um, and those are far less bitter. So they were actually specifically designed um, in, the, in the processing of them. Some of the maltsters process them and they remove the husks and everything in the processing to make the, the malt much less bitter. And a lot of um, commercial brewers nowadays use that because they just don't want to risk ruining a beer with over roasted flavors, but they still want their dark color. And so that's a, a pretty good alternative. Um, other fermentables, not really. You're not, you don't need to add anything. You've got enough malt and everything here to create a lot of good flavor. You want a kind of a medium body. So you're not going to try and make it very dry. Um, there are some brewers who do add a bit of Lyle's golden syrup to the porter. You can certainly experiment with it. And to the extent that you put that in there, you're going to get a drier, lighter bodied beer. And then hops. Traditionally, you will use the English hops. They are expensive. Um, you know, the Fuggles and East Ken Goldings are noble hops, uh, so-called because they add a lot of aroma and flavor and they, they don't add a lot of bitterness. Um, and as a result, you know, if, whereas in a, in a best bitter, I would definitely use Fuggles and Eastkin Goldings, even in the bittering stage of the beer. So even at a 60 minute or 50 minute level, I'll add Fuggles and Eastkin Goldings just because I feel tradition demands it. But a porter, because of your complexity of malts, it's almost like a bit of a waste to use those expensive hops uh, because you're just not going to taste them. So either use them only at the end of the boil um, for a little bit of flavor or you can use cheaper hops with higher alpha acids like your magnum and so on to just give it a bitterness. Most porter recipes you'll see, and I mean, I'll post some soon on the, on the website, 
um, really just have one hop addition. And it's usually a bittering hop addition, usually at 60 minutes or uh, 50 minutes or 40 minutes, or even 30 minutes. Um, any one of those time um, slots will be fine. And it's just said a bit of the beer and there's no aroma or flavor hops added because it just is overpowered by the chocolate and, and roasted flavors. So traditionally, that's kind of what you want to achieve. You just want the bitterness, but it's not a, this is not a hoppy beer. And yeast is pretty flexible. You can use either the American or the English ale yeast. Either one of those will, will produce a fine porter. Um, and both of those yeasts are very forgiving in terms of temperature and so on. So again, porter is a great starting recipe. I've, I've made lots of them in the beginning. They're not my favorite style actually to drink. Uh, but I, I have to say, like I've seldom made a bad porter. And that's not to say that I haven't made a bad porter. It's just that you can't taste that it's a bad porter. And that's all the difference, you see. So it's very forgiving um, to make some porters. And it's a lovely beer to have with friends. And, you know, a lot of people haven't had a lot of dark beers. They pretty much have only had Guinness or Castle Milk Stout. And this is a different style of beer. It's not, neither one of those styles. Uh, Castle Milk Stout is a, a milk stout. And uh, Guinness is, a, is an Irish stout. So it's not the same as a porter. A porter's got much more uh, roasty, chocolatey flavors going for it. Some other styles which I haven't mentioned, I'm not going to really go into them, but you can certainly try them. Um, but they're not as easy as the three I've mentioned today. It would be Irish red ales, very popular in South Africa. You'll get a lot of commercial examples of those. Um, Agers, Gilroy's, lots of different places make them. It's a much sweeter style of beer. American Pale Ales, I've recently uh, posted some recipes on the site uh, for American Pale Ales. Again, pretty easy. Because it has a lot of hops, it's quite forgiving. And if you, if you want to drink an excellent example of that, uh, try Jack Black's Cape Pale Ale. It's basically an American Pale Ale. I think at the moment it's probably one of the finest American Pale Ales in the country. Um, and so well worth trying out. And Brown Ales. The reason they didn't, brown ale didn't make the list is because there's just so few commercial examples for you to try. Um, American brown ales are really nice. Uh, they are hoppier versions of the English brown ale. But again, I've never actually had an American brown ale, unfortunately. Um, so, bummer. Uh, if you know anyone who can send me some, I'd really appreciate it. But uh, English brown ales I have had, uh, the Newcastle nut brown ale and so on. Um, so you can get them, but they're usually on import or you happen to have a friend who can bring them in. Just a few basics I want to end off with today before I address your questions. Just some things I've learned over the years when trying to brew two style, trying to nail a style or get, uh, get it right. Uh, yeah, someone just mentioned that Woodstock has one. You're right. Woodstock, Mr. Brownstone is a brown ale, which is made in South Africa. Forgot about that one. Okay, so kind of like an obvious one, but often overlooked is read the style description. Okay, you, you, can, you can for free download the uh, BJCP guide to styles. You can just type in BJCP in your, in your search engine and you'll find it. Uh, you can get the 2015 style guide, which is the latest. And it's for free, you can download it. You can even get it on the app. So if you go to the app store right now, well, hopefully after this webinar, don't go right now. Uh, you can even get a, an app, which is basically the style guide on your phone. So read the style description. It's got a lot of pointers on how to brew it. What are the ingredients? What are the flavors you want to get to? It's useful to start there. Then try some commercial examples. Uh, doesn't make a whole bunch of sense to try and brew a particular style if you've never had it you know, before. It doesn't really make sense. Obviously, you will eventually start brewing styles you've never had before. That's part of the fun of home brewing. But if you're tr still learning and trying to own your craft, it's useful to have an example. And then, this is really important, brew, analyze, and repeat. It's, it's one of the single best things you can do for yourself if you want to become better at brewing. There's always the temptation as a home brewer to brew each beer anew. So in other words, never brew the same beer twice, you know, because there's so many recipes out there. There's so many styles to try. You can never try them all. It seems like just something you want to do, but you're not necessarily going to improve your your technical abilities by doing this. Um, by all means, you know, you, you know, try different styles, but there's got to be a few styles you, you brew and repeat and you analyze and you try and shape them to the best possible beer you can make. Certainly if you're part of a homebrew club, 
it helps because you can take those beers to the other home brewers and they can taste it and they can you know critique it and obviously if you want to start winning competitions there are a few homebrew competitions out there this will be the only way to do so okay so don't forget the repetition of a beer is a very good thing and then try and create a style you'll be famous for i've given you the first three styles to go and check out if you're beginning in this hobby they're easy to brew they're very forgiving um, one of those three may well be the style you'll become famous for but i find that mostly depending on the kind of ingredients you have access to depending on the water you have in your brew um, house and so on and depending on your own palate and your own taste there are a few styles you will probably be able to really brew exceptionally well and it, it's really amazing when i speak to a lot of craft brewers in the work i do um, how many of them the one at least one of their commercial beers will be the first one they brewed as home brew or one of the first ones they really mastered and it, it stuck with them and it became their commercial beer as well and so, same is true for me my California common beer, which I sold um, under the name of Insurrection, was my first beer I mastered as a home brewer, and it, it stuck with me into my commercial brewing. And that is it. Please reach out to me uh, on the email there, contact at Beginner Brewer. Please go check out the website. I really love it when people go read the articles there. We've got a wealth of information there, and I'm constantly trying to update it and write more stuff. Um, and there's some exciting things in the footing. I'm not going to be able to reveal what those are just yet because I'm still in talks with various people, but it may just be that I, in the next webinar or maybe the one after that, I'll be able to tell you some pretty exciting stuff happening for Beginner Brewer where we might be moving into a, an interesting field uh, to help all of you out with more than just advice. So let me address the questions then, and thanks for those. Um, I'm just going to scroll up here to where they started. Okay, so uh, first one is using biscuits and molasses in their dark beer. I wouldn't do that. Um, not a biscuit uh, or, or anything like that. I mean, I think you could, um, you could use molasses in your beer. Um, so any kind of sugar, processed sugar, is something you can add to beer. Molasses, golden syrup, honey, um, you know, brown sugar, demerara sugar, probably a few I'm forgetting, pine, get pine sugar, um, and so on. Um, the, the stuff from Canada, maple syrup, they all can be added to beer and in different stages. You know, if you add it in the boil, often it will really just impart fermentable sugar. And if it's a strong sugar like molasses, it will, the flavor and color will retain in your beer. Uh, if it's a light sugar, it probably, I mean, like table sugar, you can certainly put in beer, but it's only going to be a fermentable sugar. There's not going to be any flavor there. Um, but something like molasses or maple syrup will retain flavor and it will flavor your beer in, to taste like those sugars. Uh, you can also add them in your fermenter. That will preserve all of the flavor um, and add some fermenta you know, fermentation in there as well. So sugars are nice to play with when you create beer. Um, but you have to be cautious. Too much sugar is going to dry out your beer to be undrinkably dry. Um, it'll often create really all flavors, um, you know, in terms of too much alcohol in the beer. Um, and sometimes also it can have that sugar burn. If you've ever had a really big spoon of sugar and it burns the back of your throat, it will also do that to your beer. So you've got to be cautious. Okay. Uh, some more questions here about the use of fresh hops. Yeah, I have used fresh hops. They're really fun to use. Not as predictable as pelletized hops because obviously it's a, still a very organic product. Um, but you can use them. You can use them in any stage of brewing. They're often better suited to uh, late stage additions. So your, your aroma hop additions and your flavor hop additions and dry hopping. That's where a lot of brewers use them is dry hopping because they have such a unique flavor and such a bright uh, flavor in, in terms of hops that adding them to a dry hop is really good. So that's when you add it to the fermenter after primary fermentation. Uh, because they float, to get the maximum out of them, you often have to put them in a bag and weight the bag with something. So whatever you can think of, as long as it's sterile. Um, I've used marbles to weight mine because they're made out of glass and easy to sterilize. Um, and so I've used it as a dry hopping mostly, and it has really got some nice flavor characteristic. It will make your beer very hazy because it has quite a lot of organic compounds, but that's fine. Um, and it's quite mild. Uh, most of the dry fresh hops uh, available will be much milder than their dry uh, cured counterparts. 
So just keep that in mind. You won't get the same level of bitterness and flavor from the same quantity, but they certainly have a very unique bright hop flavor. So well worth trying out. Um, so African hops, I'm, I have to admit, I'm not a big fan of South African hops. I've, I've used them. A lot of our commercial brewers also use the, the smaller varieties like Southern Dawn, Southern Promise, and so on, uh, which are specifically created for the craft beer market. And um, I've just never been able to use them successfully. I, you know, occasionally I've used them as a bittering hop um, because they're cheap. That's really the main reason why they're popular with commercial brewers is they're much cheaper. Um, and if you bring 10,000 liters of beer, that becomes an issue. Uh, but they tend to have a very hard, harsh flavor to me. They, because they, their parentage, where they come from, are the varieties grown for SA breweries, which were mostly just there to be very bitter, um, to bitter out lagers and you know the sort of lagers which SA brewery produces. And so even though they have kind of interesting flavors, I mean, some of them have lychee and tropical flavors, they still have a very hard bitterness. And that's got to do with the something called cohumulone, which is a chemical compound inside of hops. And a lot of those hops have high cohumulin content, which makes for a very hard bitterness. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not a big fan, but by all means, you know, try them. And there are some new ones coming out, which I believe are much nicer. How would you introduce chili pepper into beer? I've made many chili uh, beers, one of my favorites. I love a lot of chili. I pretty much eat chili in everything. Um, and I just love it. So you can. Uh, it will go with almost any beer style, but an amber ale would, would be good. Um, chili is a difficult thing to work with because it has a lot of oil in it. And anything with oil, whether it's nuts or chili or fruit or vegetables, uh, which has oil in it, will uh, really mess with your beer's head retention, for instance. You'll get no head on that beer if there's any oil, uh, you know, residual oil. And so because of the fact that chili, obviously, its heat comes from a kind of an oily substance, it can be difficult to use. Um, so you have to work your way around that issue. So many people will create a chili tincture by soaking some chilies in vodka and then, you know, filtering that vodka, which will have less oil in it, and then and adding that to the beer, often in the fermenter. You can obviously also add it in the boil. You can use dry chili, which has less oil in it, the chili powders and so on. So there are ways of definitely introducing that to the beer. Or, I mean, if you really want to be uh, pretty uh, radical, you can just pop a chili into the bottle uh, when you bottle it and just leave it there. That should be interesting. I've done that. It does create very unpredictable beers, I have to say, um, because sometimes it's just so hot you can't drink it. Uh, so depending on your, your palate, you may want to just experiment with it. You don't need a lot. In a 19-liter batch, if you add the equivalent of about two whole chilies, you will definitely taste it. So you don't have to go overboard, um, but be careful. And also, if you are going to add chili in a fermenter, you have to sterilize it. Um, chili, any fruit skin or vegetable skin has a lot of wild yeast growing on it. That's why chilies naturally ferment if you stick them in a bottle with some vinegar and so on, uh, or water and sugar rather. And um, so you've got to you've got to sterilize that. So you must either boil it, blanch it, steam it, uh, soak it in vodka for a bit to sterilize that before you put it in the fermenter. Okay, um, so yeah, I will definitely uh, have a webinar on reusing yeast and, and basically maybe a webinar on yeast health, which is probably one of the single most important principles of brewing good beer. Okay, um, I'm still looking for some questions here. Okay, so base fermentation for a, a porter, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you mean uh, temperature. Again, it's pretty forgiving because it's going to be dependent on the yeast you use. But uh, any, any kind of room temperature, so anything from about, you know, 16 to 25 will be fine for fermenting a porter. It won't uh, ruin the beer at all. Those yeasts, both the English and the American ale yeast are very forgiving for high, even higher temperatures. But as soon as you get over 25 to 26 degrees, you've got a problem. Most yeasts, unless it's a, something like a Saison yeast or some of the specialist, uh, you know, sort of Nordic yeasts, are, are not great with high temperature fermentation. And they will produce something called fusel alcohol, uh, which is a different kind of alcohol, which is produced at high temperatures. And it gives you a massive headache and it, uh, it makes the beer taste very boozy, very heavy. Um, and if you've ever had a home brew, 
And I'm talking about like one, one bottle of homebrew, which gives you a headache. It makes you feel like you've got a hangover. It's because it, it probably had fusel alcohol in it, which is not a, it's not a poisonous form of alcohol, but it's not a, it's not a very drinkable form of alcohol. And that's usually a, a result of high temperatures of fermentation with the inappropriate yeast for that temperature. Okay. Um, would you use syrup overall honey? It depends on what you want to achieve. Um, honey will definitely impart a honey flavor to your beer. So if you don't want that honey flavor in your beer, I would rather use a, a simple sh uh, sugar syrup or something like that. But if you like the flavor of honey, definitely add it in the fermenter, add it in your, your late stages of boil. So 10 minutes or so before the end, and it will definitely retain that honey flavor. Okay. I think that's it for everyone. Thanks so much for all the questions and, and the participation. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, watch out on the Facebook channel and on the website uh, where we'll be posting more notifications of upcoming webinars. They will, I'm trying to get one out, you know, twice a month. So in two weeks time, there should be another one and maybe we'll, I'll see what people say, but I think maybe something on yeast health and ye reuse of yeast might be a good idea. And uh, please go and check out our YouTube channel where I post all the recordings of these sessions. Uh, you can go and uh, check that out. So thanks so much, everyone. And I'll see you when I see you. Happy brewing.